finishing our series in Jeremiah. How about that? We made up to chapter 15. We'll be uh, mainly in chapter 14 today. And uh, we've kind of gone through all this series about what is a godly shepherd. And we have a godly shepherd who trusts in God. A godly shepherd repents to God. A godly shepherd rests and walks with God. A godly shepherd marvels at God. A godly shepherd is humble, humbles himself or herself before God. And finally, a godly shepherd is forgiven. Um, but pretend you didn't see that, otherwise you kind of have no point in listening to the sermon. So um, today we're, uh, I wonder, if I were to ask you if you're forgiven, that's probably a, a decent percentage of you would say, yeah, I'm, I'm forgiven, I'm a Christian, I'm, I've put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I'm forgiven. And uh, I would say I'm forgiven, but there's a whole other level of forgiven. You can be forgiven of your sins, and you can know that on a theological level, but it's a whole other thing to walk in the experience of being forgiven. That the experience of, of, of what that means, that you are saved by grace, and how that means in my daily life is a whole other story as far as the practicality of the gospel message. And today we're going to look at not just what does it mean to be forgiven, but then what does it mean for me on a daily basis? What does that mean? How can I approach God with being forgiven? So today we'll be in Jeremiah chapter 14, some in 15, and then uh, later on we'll go to the book of Exodus. We're just, I'm just going to pray, and we're going to dedicate this time to the Lord here. So if you bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. What a beautiful day it is. Uh, Lord, thank you that it's gotten cooler. Uh, we thank you, Lord, ultimately for your son, Jesus Christ. They went to the cross to die for our sins so that we might be forgiven. I pray, Lord, as we open up your word in this older uh, prophet book of Jeremiah that you can unveil uh, yourself through your inspired word of God, Lord. We believe that you wrote this. We believe that it is truth to our lives. Um, and I pray, Lord, that you will speak to each one of us on an individual level, that you will strengthen, challenge, equip, and encourage us in our walks with you. I pray you'll be with me uh, and my, infer my insecurities and my inferiorities here, Lord. Um, we leave those at the cross to be able to come and preach your word and pray uh, that you use uh, your word today. I pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. Uh, it's been a challenging week this week uh, for me as going through, it, you think, going through the process of trying to put together a sermon about being forgiven should be a really encouraging thing, right? I mean, what, what could be more encouraging than, hey, you're forgiven? The, the flip side of being forgiven is that you have to be forgiven of certain things. Like, if you're a perfect person, you, forgiveness means nothing. So for me to realize I'm forgiven, I first have to realize God has to teach me all the sin in my life that I need to be forgiven from. And there's nothing more discouraging than finding out how much of a wretched sinner you are. And we come to, going through this process, you know, of trusting, repenting, walking, resting, walking, marveling, humbling, I'm starting to feel pretty good with my, myself. You know, last week I was, I was pretty humble last week, if I do say so myself. And uh, so you kind of come through that, and, and then it kind of wrecks you a little bit when God's like, hey, Kevin, there's some things, there's some closets here that haven't really been exposed much. There's some things that you've maybe hidden away and insecurities and doubts and fears and, and sins that, 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 you know, as I'm walking through, I think I'm doing pretty good. And God's like, oh, I'm glad you're doing good. Now we can open up another door. And the gospel can come in here and, and we've got to shine the light. And then my heart says, ooh, I don't, that doesn't feel very comfortable, God. I like myself the way I am. And when God shines the light on my sin, it's not a very fun experience. And today we're going to look at Jeremiah when... Uh, we're going to look at the gospel play out in these people's lives, Jeremiah chapter 14. So if you have your Bibles, Jeremiah chapter 14. And uh, it's really crazy passage. Like pretty much every passage in Jeremiah is crazy. But this one's particular. And you might be asking yourself the question, wait, what did you say, God? Can you just repeat that one more time? What did you say, God? But, you know, you, you write this sermon. You tell me what you think. So although, verse 7, chapter 14. Although our iniquities testify against us, O oh Lord, act for your name's sake. Truly, our apostasies or our sins have been many we have sinned against you. The people of Jeremiah, people at Jeremiah's time, the Israelites, they seem like they're sorry. They want to come to God and confess their sins, and this seems really good. But you tell me if you think it's good. Verse 7, it keeps going. A hope of Israel, its Savior in time of distress. Why are you like a stranger in the land or like a traveler who's pitched his tent for the night? Why are you like a man, dismayed, like a mighty man who cannot save? But you are in our midst, O Lord, and we are called by your name. Do not forsake us. 
Now, people who are looking to be forgiven by God, is this, is this a good th- situation for them to be in? Is this, is this what you would say is them asking, you know, repenting of their sins, coming to God? Like, is, isn't this what we want as a church and for the world, really? Y'all, I, okay, y'all, y'all, y'all know me too well to answer yes or no to questions, right? And so uh, if they're visiting, they're like, man, this is a very quiet church. It's because they're scared of getting it wrong because I trick people. Not intentionally. I don't know why I do it. Uh, maybe that's another closet God's trying to work into. But anyway, yeah, so you look at this, and I'll be honest. This is what I'm reading. This is great. Man, these sinners, they're coming. To, they're repenting of their sin. They recognize their sin. They've recognized they've sinned against God, and they want God to save them. Like, this is amazing. This is what we want. We want genuine repentance for their sins. And so what does God say? What does God say when genuine repentant sinners come before him? Say, Lord, I want to be saved from my sins. I need you to rescue me from my life. Verse 10. Thus says the Lord to this people, therefore the Lord does not accept them. Now before you walk out, give me a chance, okay? This is the kind of things that... uh, when I watch sermons online, sometimes you just see people have like three minutes and they take the three-minute heathen part. This is the three-minute heathen part. But just bear with me till we get to the fourth minute. Therefore, the Lord does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquity and call their sins to account. He's like, oh, I'm going to remember your sin. I'm not going to forget. Verse 11, so the Lord said to me, this is Jeremiah, do not pray for the wealth of this people. I am not going to accept them. Rather, I'm going to make an end to them by the sword, famine, and pestilence. Whew. This is nuts. I mean, imagine going to someone and saying, look, I, I'm sorry. I, I've, I said some things, mean things last week. I, I'm going to ask for your forgiveness. I'm sorry. And that person's saying, you know what? Okay. Nope, I'm not. Here's my sword. Whishing! I'm going to bring a famine. I'm going to steal all your groceries. I'm going to bring locusts and bugs and plagues. You're going to pay for your sin. This is, this is the kind of God you want to serve? The visitors are like, man, what kind of church do I come in? I thought it was a church of Christ. This seems like a church of something else. So how do you, the question is, how do you balance this, though? How do you balance when what appears to be genuine repentance coming to God, and we, under this assumption in our, in our Christian theology, it says God saves sinners who repent of their sins. And basically it comes down to those, there's two things. And, and both of these cannot be right. You have to pick one way or the other. And there's, there's two propositions we live our lives by. The first one says God always saves sinners to repent. He always saves sinners to repent. That's a proposition. You either agree with that or you don't agree with that. And so when you come in here, we're like, well, this appears like it's not. So either it is and we're missing something, or maybe God doesn't always save sinners to repent. That's the first proposition. The second proposition says, maybe this isn't genuine repentance. Maybe this isn't genuine repentance. And then you say, well, what's more likely? Is it more likely that God doesn't actually save sinners who repent from, with a genuine heart? Or is it more likely that maybe we've missed something? This actually isn't people who are genuinely repentant of their sins. And I would hold, when I look through the Bible, when I look through all these pages and all these stories, I see a God who is always, always saving sinners who repent. He's always faithful to forgive when I come to say, Lord, I'm sorry. So therefore, it means that these people must not be actually genuine repentant of their sins. And we're going to look back at this chapter. I'm going to kind of break it down a little bit. Is, what is genuine repentance? So although our iniquities testify against us, we've gone back to verse 7. So they recognize, they recognize that their own sins have had consequences in their life. Oh, Lord, act for your name's sake. Now, when, you say, when they say something like, okay, we've had, I robbed the bank, now I'm going to jail. That's a consequence, but that's a factual statement. They're not sharing their heart there. They're not saying, man, I'm really, I'm really sorry that I've sinned, God. It's just a statement. Yeah, God, I, I know I messed up, and there's consequences. I know I messed up. But there's no sorry. There's no, I need to repent. But it's, Lord, I know I messed up here, but can you, can you come and help me? I know I've messed up, and I made a wreck of this situation, but I need you to help me. And that may sound like a bit arrogant, but I do that literally all the time. I mess up all the time, and then I'm, I come out, Lord, I, yeah, I know I, uh, you know, I was speeding there, officer, but, you know, can you just cut me a little slack here? Like, it's not that big of a deal, right? Like, it's just a few kilometers over, not a big deal, right? And I'm not genuinely sorry that I went a couple kilometers over, but please, can you, can you do me a favor here? But here they plead specifically, they come before God and say, Lord, act for 
your namesake. Act for your namesake. And that sounds really good. It sounds very biblical. God, you're amazing. Act for your namesake. But what they're really doing is saying, God, I know I've sinned. I know I've messed up. But you need to come and rescue me or you're going to look bad. You've got to step up here, God, because people are going to say that you're a weak God that can't do much. So, yeah, I know I'm sinning. I'm robbing banks and I'm being mean to people and there's all this stuff in my life. But you know what? Not a big deal. You've got to help me or you're going to look bad. And God's like, excuse me. God's like, you can't leverage my glory against myself. It doesn't look that, work that way. God's like, I'm a big God. I got a lot of glory. And just because you're over here doesn't mean I have to save you for me to look good. In fact, I can just imagine God having this conversation and, and thinking of Jesus coming. He's like, you think I have a problem looking bad? Wait till Jesus comes and he's mocked and scorned and abused and ridiculed. And, and There's a lot of people that think bad of God. I can't leverage God's glory against him. It doesn't work that way. We looked at last week about being humble, that when I'm humble, I can contribute to the glory of God, but I can't take away from the glory of God. God is glorious, full stop. There's nothing I can do. He was glorious before creation began. He's going to be more glorious when creation ends. He's fully, uh, fully content in his glory. That's not like I can come and say, hey, God, I'm going to take some of your glory. I'm going to take some of their glory. Now, if you want it back, you've got to work in my life. And the Israelites have completely missed the concept of what God wants to do in their life. So they continue on and say, Truly our apostasy have been many. We have sinned against you. Yeah, we've messed up a lot, God. Yeah, okay, now here's a good time to say, and we're sorry for those sins. But they don't. They say, oh, hope of Israel, its Savior in time of distress. It's a plural, help our town, but don't help me. Not on an individual, I don't need salvation. But yeah, help, you know, help Australia, God. But it's a personal thing. And then it says, verse 9, it says, Why are you like a stranger in the land or like a traveler who's pitched his tent? When we don't have genuine repentance, look what they do. They actually blame God. God, what? I know we've done all these bad things, but God, why, why are you far away? Why aren't you here, God? I don't know if you do this, but I do this a lot. When I'm like, God, I know I, I messed up this week, but you know, if uh, last Wednesday was like 400 million degrees, and I don't do well when it's hot, and when I'm just sweating profusely, and it's not just that, it's also like 200% humidity, so it's just, and my neighbor has this really nice pool that looks out over this like canyon, and just looks super nice, and I'm in my house and just <laughs> sweating, 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 and when I'm, when I'm very... Maybe you guys would do great in the heat, but I don't do well in the heat. And my whole family doesn't do well in the heat. You get a whole bunch of us, all five of us, we're all hot, sweaty, stinky, miserable. Uh, it really brings out the, the Christian in us very, very well. And uh, we're, we're really the perfect model of a pastor's family when we're all hot, stinking, tired. Um, and so there's some things that happen that day where I'm not proud of and I later have to repent of. But as it, as it happens, I'm like, I'm just so tired. I'm so frustrated with the heat. I'm so miserable. And I just... I don't have the patience. I don't have the love and the kindness I should offer. And you know what? I don't even really care. I'm like, God, if, it, if you didn't make it so hot, we'd all be fine now. This is really your fault. I mean, I'm not saying that, but deep down, that's what I'm thinking. Like, oh, yeah, I got angry, but it's just so hot. No, Kevin, you got angry because you've got a sin problem, and you need to bring that to the Lord and experience for, sorry, forgiveness. That forgiveness is going to play a part of all of this. So they come and say, look, Lord, you're like a stranger. If you had been here, then maybe we wouldn't have had all these problems. God's like, no, no, you can't blame me for your sin. That's not how it works. Why are you, and they, they attack his character. Why are you like a man dismayed, like a mighty man who cannot save? Can you imagine telling God that? God, why, man, you can't even save, man. Look at all the problems. I mean, you can't save me. I hear this all the time. In fact, someone was here this morning, I'm all these problems, and God doesn't care about me. Well, he does care about you. He loves you. But if you rob a bank, then God's not going to be like, I'll rescue you from that. It just doesn't work that way. He can, but he wants your heart. And more often than not, we look at God and we're like, God, rescue me from my circumstance, but don't rescue me from my heart. Can you imagine uh, having a surgery? Let's say you have cancer in you, and you go to the doctor and say, Doc, I got this I'm not feeling very good here. Can you fix me? He's like, okay, well, we've got to open you up. We've got to do some heart surgery. Got to get in there. We've got to take it out. And you be like, oh, well, hold on, God. I mean, hold on, Doc. 
No, no. You can, you can give me new clothes or new haircut, but, but you're not cutting in here. We're not doing that. It's not to be too painful. Then we got the, the physio afterwards and the it's hard to sleep and it's just not being in the hospital stinks. And no, no, no. Just, just, just give me new clothes and it'll all be good. And like, that doesn't do anything. God's like, I'm not just interested in your circumstances. It's like, I got to get to your heart. But the problem is when we don't have genuine repentance, we start to develop a hard heart. And we're going to look at this, the rest of the sermon, really, about what does this hard heart look like and what does it do? Thus the Lord said to the people, even though they have loved to wander, they have not kept their feet in check. They actually enjoyed sinning. They didn't want to keep the check. Therefore the Lord does not accept them. Not because he doesn't want to, but because he can't. Now he will remember their iniquity and call their sins to account. So the Lord said, do not pray for the welfare of this people. Notice he doesn't say, do not pray for the people. Pray for the people. He's like, don't pray for the welfare of the people. He's like, because I don't actually want to bring them to me, so I'm not going to accept their burnt offering or their grain offering. I'm not going to accept their fasting. Rather, I'm going to make an end to them by the sword, famine, and pestilence. Now in this, we have, um, we're going to go to Jeremiah chapter 15, 15 here, but I'm going to get a little set up here, okay? Because this is, I know we've got a lot of theology, a lot of bad news, a lot of, wow, this is not a very encouraging sermon, Kevin. Where's, where, where's the hope here? That's a good question. Maybe you should come up and preach sometime. And then, then I could learn from you. That'd be great. So what happens here is Jeremiah hears this, and he's like, man, this is all really bad. Like, these people, they've sinned willingly, and they're okay with it. Like I was this week, where I was so hot and tired, I was like, you know, I'm not even sorry anymore. And, and a, a few minutes later, I'd be like, what is going on? How come there's that wickedness in me that knows I've sinned, and I'm not even sorry? So then I go and apologize to my family, and, and, and but I'll, the hard heart starts to develop. And so Jeremiah says, look, God, maybe, maybe I can say sorry on behalf of all the Israelites. Will you accept that? Will you accept if I go, maybe a representative can go and say sorry. And God says to them, then the Lord said to me, even though Moses and Samuel were to stand before me, my heart would not be, out, would not be with these people. Send them away from me and my presence. Let them go. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to go back to this story where Moses did go before God and did plead for the people. This is the story in the golden calf. I know we hit the story in Jeremiah earlier. I don't know why I like the story. It's a weird story. It's a crazy story, but it just, I don't know, it grips me. There's just so much here. So in this story, we're going to look at a few things about uh, what, they, they didn't have genuine repentance. So what does genuine repentance look like then? Well, it doesn't look like this. Genuine repentance is pretty genuine. I don't have to explain. I have to go through. Here's the five steps of genuine repentance. Genuine repentance is genuine. When you say, God, I'm sorry, and I mean it. When I was uh, about five or six, we went to church, and I had my next-door neighbor. His name was Isaac. And we invited him to church one Sunday, and then they were handing out communion. And, they were, you know, they, and he's like, oh, man, they have juice and crackers. He's like, man, this is sweet, morning tea in church. I said, well, yeah, but we, we kind of believe it's more than that. We, we kind of believe, you know, you need to be a Christian, and then it's a, it's a sign of, you know, Jesus' sacrifice. And he's like, well, what do I need to do to be a Christian? I was like, this is awesome. Well, you need to ac accept him in your heart, repent of your sins. And then I said, and you need to mean it. And anyway, he's like six. And so he says, okay. So he says, says the magic prayer. And I'm like, sweet, pumped, led someone to, led to, led someone to the Lord. And it comes around, and my mom's like, Kevin, I don't think that's quite how, I don't think it's quite how it works. Anyway, so he moves on. He does his life. I haven't hardly known him since then. But he, it, it clearly it wasn't genuine repentance. All right? He wanted to feed. He didn't really want the Lord. And the, uh, genuine repentance is just genuine. It says, Lord, I come to you because I really want you to be the Lord of my life. I'm really sorry for my sins. I need you to be my Lord and Savior. And so this story is... Uh, the golden calf. So Moses is on the mountain. He has the Ten Commandments. He comes down. He's about to lead the people. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down the mountain, this is Exodus chapter 32, verse 1, sorry. When he delayed to come down the mountain, uh, the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, Come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses guy, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Now Aaron has a choice here. All right, He can step up and be a godly shepherd, lead his people, while coming before his God, point people to, to God, or his hard heart can lead him down a path that he's going to regret. And so Aaron said to them, Tear off your golden rings, which are on your ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. Then all the people tore off the golden rings, which were in their ears, and brought them to Aaron. Then Aaron, he took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. 
This will show up later. This is why it's important. And God really wants you to know, Aaron was really particular. Like he, he actually put effort into this. He had his, he had his toolbox there, and he, he's got all the gold there. He's molten, making this golden calf. And he said, this is your God, O Israel, which brought you up from the land of Egypt. Which is hilarious because it, the golden calf was made after they came out of Egypt. You know, and how did, how did that work? Um, anyway, apparently this God can go back in time and help us all. Anyway, so then Moses comes down. I'll oh, sorry, one more verse before we get to Moses coming down. Now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron, see all these Aaron's? Aaron, 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 Aaron. We're going to look at what Aaron did to develop a hard heart. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. So he's substituted God for this God. That word Lord is literally Yahweh. He literally is making the golden calf to be the new Yahweh. Because this other Yahweh didn't work out. We're making Yahweh now the golden calf. And so then Moses comes down. He sees this golden calf. And he's like, what in the world is going on? I was gone 40 days and now we're worshiping a cow? Oh my goodness. Is that, if I go on holidays, that's what's going to happen? I can come back and the giant golden cow is going to be up here? No, no, we, 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 I, I trust you guys. I trust you guys better than that. And so he, he, Moses comes down, and he's like, this is the stupidest thing I could possibly imagine. And he gives Aaron the benefit of the doubt, and he says, Aaron, what did the people do to you that you have brought such great sin upon them? <laughs> he's giving the benefit of the doubt. He's like, okay, surely you wouldn't be this dumb to create a golden cow. What do they do? Do they tie you up? Do they put a gun to your head, a boomerang to your neck? Like, I don't know. And so what does Aaron do? Now, here's where Aaron, the genuine repentance can come and play. He can say, look, I'm sorry, I messed up. And God and the gospel of the fruit will forgive him. It's there. Or you can let your heart run and develop a hard heart that will catalyze and come up with all these excuses. So the hard heart's gonna blame basically four things. So here's Aaron's reply. Aaron said, do not let the anger of my Lord burn. So, look, Aaron, it's no big, sorry, look, Moses, no biggie. It's not a big, don't be angry. A hard heart downplays sin, downplays the consequences of sin. It's one thing when other, someone sins against me, when, so, when I'm going to the grocery store. Like the last few weeks at the grocery store, the south side has been like out of milk. And you go, then there's like one bottle of milk left. I'm like, I got three kids, man. I have to have this milk or we're not going to sleep. And someone gets it and you're like, you know, judge them, God. But if I take the last one, oh, you know what? It's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to bring judgment, but I don't want judgment at me. And, and so the, the hard heart downplays sin. Look, look, Moses, don't be angry. It's not a big deal. So we led the whole nation astray, and they're worshiping a cow. What, oh, what's a big deal? Later on, it costs about 3,000 people their lives, so it's a very big deal. So the first one was we downplay sin, downplay the seriousness of sin. Second thing he says, you know the people yourself, that they are prone to evil. Moses, look, you know, all these people, are, they're really a bunch of bad sinners. A hard heart blames others rather than themselves. I was supposed to speak at chapel this week. I say supposed to. It's a really complicated story, and I'm going to try to make it very simple. Uh, but there was basically five different people that miscommunicated all over the shop. And so I go there to, uh, go to, there to preach the Word of God. I wasn't really prepared because I didn't know I was going to be on. They called me the day before. So I'm just kind of freaking out, show up at the church. I'm like, Lord, I don't know what I'm going to say. We're just going to have to get up there and, you know, just hopefully something good happens. Anyway, I get there. I, I, I put in the USB stick. We've got the PowerPoint working. I pray with the team, and, and everything's ready. And, and then another pastor walks in, and he thinks he's preaching. And, man, you get two pastors in the same building, and pff, no go, no go. Anyway, so he comes in, and we have a friendly conversation. And I'm like, man, I'm not really prepared, so it's probably better that you take this anyway. And so we work that out. But then I have to go back and tell everyone, look, I'm not on, and then I have to go to the sound guy and get my USB stick. I got to go sign out at the front of the school, and, and everywhere I go, everyone thinks I'm the idiot who made a mistake, you know? And so, like, oh, you showed up on the day you weren't supposed to. Man, you're unorganized, you know, and well, you look embarrassing. And every time I come, there was, especially the first one, my, my flesh was like, oh, look, you, first you got to understand there's like five miscommunications. I wouldn't be this dumb. And I'm, def and I'm blaming others. And when in reality, it all started because it was my mistake. I was the one that said, hey, can I swap rosters? And I put the wrong month down. Apparently, February and March have the same days, land on the same days of the weeks. That's pretty common knowledge. I didn't know that until this week. So I must have missed that class. So I said, hey, look, I can do February 20th, and I meant March 20th. And so it was this huge, giant miscommunication, and all because of me. But it's easier to blame all the other four people rather than blame myself. And so the first time I did, and then... 
God brought this message to heart. He's like, Kevin, do you know that you're literally preaching and not blaming other people? I was like, oh, oops. And so when I get to the sound desk and the front desk, and they said, oh, man, you've messed it all up, huh? I was like, yeah, I did, actually. I I said the wrong month. And here's where the gospel of, of forgiveness is so amazing, is that that actually is freeing. Because, see, forgiveness means that God has already died for everything I've ever done wrong. I don't have to prove myself to anybody. I don't have to maintain an image in front of everyone. That God knows me for everything who I am. I don't have to pretend to live up to something. I don't have to try and protect myself from something. I can literally be myself. And I can come to say, yeah, I messed up. But you know what? I'm forgiven. I'm going to heaven. I'm a child of God. How amazing is that? And free, forgiveness is, leads to freedom. And sin leads to me being shackled where I have to be, I hope no one finds out about that embarrassing email I sent. I hope no one finds out that Kevin doesn't know the days that February and March land on the same day. How embarrassing is that? It doesn't matter. I'm free. And the reality is a lot of us can be forgiven, but we don't walk in forgiveness. And so Aaron does two more things here. Then he says, For they said to me, Make a God for us who will go before us. For this Moses guy, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron basically says, Yo, Mo, if you were here, this wouldn't have happened. This is really all your fault. (laughs) Moses is like, Ah, what? He said, This is all your fault. If if you had been a better leader, then I wouldn't have sinned. That's probably what you think about me, huh? If you had been a better pastor, Kevin, I would have grown more spiritually. If you had been a pastor, I wouldn't have sinned. But we do. We blame authority. We blame the government. I, in fact, I had a conversation this week where I was blaming the Australian government. And then I was remembering this like, man, it's not really the Australian government's problem. I'm the one that has a problem. We like to blame authority, whether it's our boss, whether it's our, uh, our parents, for uh, the kids or our grandparents. We all like to love to blame authority. It's so much easier to look in hindsight 2020 and be like, oh, yeah, that leader, he did a really bad job. Yeah, of course he did. Instead of looking at the sin in my own life. And finally... This is the funniest. This is probably, the I would say, arguably the funniest verse in all the Bible. Where Moses said, I said to them, whoever is in your gold, let them tear it off. So they gave it to me. And I threw it into the fire, and out came this cow. It was just the craziest thing. And Moses was like, you should have been there. And also, I just got all the gold. I threw it in this calf. Just, just just rose up. And I don't know how it happened. Moses was like, oh, my gosh. Lord, this is my number two? Really? This is my number two. This is why God, particularly in the earlier part of the passage, specifically said Aaron got his tools out and made this. So that way when you get to this, you know it wasn't. We, we like to just blame luck and fate. Oh, uh, you know, it was just bad luck that week that I just, I, I really had no choice. I had to sin. It just kind of happened. I, it was, what else was I going to do? Ran out of money. Well, I got to rob the bank. And I was like, what? No. Why don't we just go trust the Lord? Why don't we go seek the Lord? And this whole time, Mo, Aaron easily could have come and said, yeah, Moses, I, I, I made a mistake. I'm sorry. I need to get right with God. Instead, he looks like an idiot. And when, I don't know if you're, you probably don't see it in yourself, but you can see when other people, when they're trying to make excuses for things that they made wrong, normally they just sound like an idiot. You're like, well, okay, that, that's a really bad excuse. Surely you could have done better than that. You know, when you tell your wife, oh, I, I acted out because it's so hot. You're like, really? It's just the temperature is the problem. Kevin's not the problem. It's just the temper's the problem. So he blames luck and fate. Genuine repentance doesn't look uh, to God as the problem, but looks to God as the exposer. That all this stuff really, that God leads me in my life, is trying to expose my heart. Say, Kevin, look, there's some cancer in there. We've got to get it out. That sin will lead to death. And we're either going to heart our heart and say, no, God, I'm not comfortable with that. Or we say, yes, God. And the reason why I can say yes, God, is because I've already been exposed on the cross. That Jesus, I mean, think about it. The fact that Jesus died on the cross, he had to die for something. That was my sin. And so what is, when we look through what genuine repentance looks like, because I'm forgiven, it means I have nothing to prove. I don't have to prove anything to anybody. Ultimately, it doesn't matter what you think about me or the sermon because I'm valued by God. And I, I do care, and I want to get better. But at the end of the day, I don't have to live for that. I have to live for the gospel. Because I'm forgiven, I have nothing to hide. I've been completely exposed. I'm a che- I've cheated on a Bible test before. I've told you that in the past. Like it, that's pretty bad, a Bible pastor cheating on a Bible test. But God loves me, and he's forgiven me, and we've moved on. It's been great. Because I'm forgiven, I have nothing to earn. I don't have to try and earn my way, not just for salvation, but 
we often try to earn favor with the people around us, with our family and our bosses, our, our, our peers. We really value that respect. It says, ultimately, it doesn't matter because I'm forgiven. That God, is, Jesus has done all the earning for me already. The only person that really matters who thinks of me is God. And he looks at Jesus and he sees Jesus looking really good. He doesn't see me looking really bad. Because I'm forgiven, I have nothing to protect. Uh, what if people find out about this, this dark closet, this sin I have? What if, what if people find out maybe they won't accept me anymore? Do you see why forgiveness is so important? Because I'm accepted, it doesn't matter if I'm exposed and accepted by people because I'm already accepted by Christ. We walk, well, many of us don't walk in the knowledge on forgiveness. Because I'm forgiven, I have nothing to be scared of. I mean, Jesus beat death. Uh, there's nothing in my life where Jesus is going to interact with and be like, oh man, oh Kevin, you've really got yourself stuck in this one. I don't, I don't, it's just too powerful. I don't think I can do it. I made the whole universe in six days, but man, you've really gotten yourself in a problem. I mean, I have nothing to be afraid of. Jesus says, my, my burden is light. Please give me your burdens. I don't know if you've ever met anybody in your life that says, please, I don't have enough worries. I want to take your worries on. <laughs> no one does that. Jesus does it. He says, man, I want to have your worries. I want to have your burdens. Because I am forgiven, I am free. We're going to look here. We're going to go back to Jeremiah. We're going to finish with this here as we're starting to run out of time. Therefore, thus says the Lord. This is Jeremiah 15, verse 19. As he's talking to Jeremiah, no longer the whole people, but he talks to Jeremiah, which is on behalf of the people as well. But he says, therefore, thus says the Lord, if you return to me, then I will restore you. Forgiveness is there. The only covenant is genuine repentance. God says, I, I've died on the cross. It's here. I'm not going to force you to be a Christian. I'm not going to grab you and bring you to the cross. But if you want forgiveness, it's there. And maybe you're here today and you haven't had forgiveness. Maybe you're, you are under the weight of your sin and your burdens and your stress. And God's like, man, I want that. I love you. Let me be Lord of your life. And the challenge here is what says, uh, then I will make you, when we do come to God and we experience the forgiveness, God says, then I will make you to this people, a fortified wall of bronze. And though they fight against you, they will not prevail over you. For I am with you to save you and deliver you. This is what forgiveness does to us. See, God says, you come and you'll be saved. And as a result of the forgiveness, as a result of the gospel, then you can live a life where you are a fortified wall. Someone, literally before church started, someone was swearing at me, some random person walking by. It's more probably a spiritual battle's probably than anything else, but it threw me off my game. You know, coming here and want to love on people, and the first person you meet is swearing at you. It's, it kind of rouses you up, and I've got to come back to the God. Lord, it doesn't matter. There's one person, I don't know what's going on, but Lord, I'm going to come to you and say, God, I'm forgiven. Help me to walk in the light of the gospel. Help me to walk in the light of the gospel, that he, you are there to save me and deliver me. And so here we come to the last part here, which I think is very interesting. I love this verse here in um, this is back in Exodus. This is how the story ends. Moses says, okay, Aaron's messed up. All the people messed up. I'm going to go to God. On the next day, Moses said to the people, you yourselves have committed a great sin. And now I'm going up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make an atonement for your sin. Moses is going to try and be the atonement, meaning the substitute here for their sin. I'm going to go on behalf of all you guys. Well, not you guys. You guys are fine. The, the Israelites. I mean, you're not fine. You're sinners, but the Israelites are the big problem here. And Moses says, I'm going to go on behalf of those guys to God, and maybe, perhaps, he will forgive them. And you know what God says? This, this is what God says to them. He says, the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. It's like, Moses, I, I'm not going to take it. You're not going to be the atonement. Just like when Jeremiah goes to God, God's like, no, I'm not going to do it. But there was somebody greater than Moses and greater than Jeremiah who did do it. Who, who, who said, I'm going to go on behalf of all the people in their sin. And perhaps, there's not a perhaps with Jesus. That Jesus came and he was the atonement. That he was the punishment for our sin. That I'm going to the Lord and I will make an atonement for your sin, Jesus said. The question is, what do we do with that then? It's very exhausting to try and justify yourself. It's very exhausting to try and, and, and live that life with a calloused heart. It's exhausting. You get tired. You get angry. And then you're ruining relationships around you. It's very, very refreshing on the other end to come to the Lord and say, Man, look what Jesus has already done. I don't have to do all the work. I don't have to justify myself. Jesus has justified me. And he's, he's a much better at legal things than I am. That's for sure. 
So as we come, as I conclude here, the last thing I'm going to say here is that if you look on this, these boards here of what does it mean to be a godly shepherd, five of the, the first five weeks are all stuff that we do. I, I'm coming to God. I'm going to trust in him. I'm going to repent. I'm going to walk with him. I'm going to marvel at him. I'm going to humble. But the last one is something you don't do. You can't forgive yourself. But God can do it. This is something that's done to you. And you have to, the only thing we have to do is be able to, all we have to do is just remember it. That during your day, you might remember, Lord, what does it mean for the gospel to play out in my life? What does it mean for me to be forgiven? I don't have to reach and strive and earn and, and be scared and hide and protect. I can just be exposed for who I am. That in my relationships, Lord, you're the number one. And you can bring a lot of freedom in our lives. I don't know where your dark closets are. And ultimately, it doesn't matter. But God does. And he says, man, I want to come in there. I want to set you free. I want to forgive that. I want you to walk in freedom where you don't have to be embarrassed. You don't have to hide. But I'm here that you might be a fortified city of bronze. May we walk in that truth today. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come to you today. And the most important truth we could possibly know, Lord, is that we are forgiven. Not just that... That, you've, you, that you're there for the, to, to lead us, not there, not just that you protect us, Lord, but the very core of who we are and what we need is forgiveness, Lord. That just saying that, Lord, I am forgiven, it just brings joy. And I pray today, Lord, that there are people who, are, who, are, who have no knowledge of forgiveness, but that you might show them what it means to be forgiven, that they might repent of their sin and come to you, Lord. I pray, Lord, for those who have been forgiven, that you might show them what it means to walk in the truth of the gospel, what it means to walk in the knowledge that they are forgiven, that we don't have to go back to where we were, but we are forgiven of you, Lord. I pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. I'm going to ask the communion people to come up. We're going to take communion. I thought, what a better way to finish our series in Jeremiah with the talk about forgiveness as we take communion. And if you're new here with us today, for, uh, communion just simply is when Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. When you come together as a group, just remember that I went to the cross that you might be forgiven. Remember that you're forgiven, that I've saved you from your sins. That as we analyze our own heart and say, Lord, where are the hard heart is, where's the hard heart in me? Where's the catalyst in me that I need to, to let you and the forgiveness and the gospel just penetrate and help take away? That you might take the next minute or two and just, Reflect in your own life. Lord, where, where's the hard heart in me? And I just bring it to the cross and the concept of forgiveness. We'll hand out the, the juice and the bread. And if you're a Christian, regardless of where you go to church or what you believe, you're welcome to participate with us. Uh, how we do it here is we take the bread and just hold the cup, and then we'll take the cup together at the end. Go ahead. I'll just pray as they start doing that. Lord, I pray as we go through communion here that you might help us remember what you've done, Lord, that your body was broken, that we might live, that your blood was spilt, that we might be saved, that we might be forgiven. And we come to you, Lord, today with that. Amen.